Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, our continuing adventures with Croesus by William Alexander, first Earl of Stirling, uh, who has been doing sterling work so far. I know, I'm sorry, I'm not sorry. Uh, with uh, with this play, Croesus, uh, one of the monarchic uh, tragedies uh, that he uh, published in the early 17th century, uh, coming uh, down into England, I think. I, I don't know, I assume he came with James uh, when uh, James ascended the throne uh, and that he's associated that way. I haven't done that much research into William Alexander yet, uh, but uh, he has, I say, uh, four plays to his name that uh, uh, we are aware of and uh, we're going to start working through. And... Uh, I say so far we rather we rather uh, dug into uh, some of uh, some of what's been going on in Croesus and uh, and uh, hoping fingers crossed that the the rest of the play is not going to disappoint as we get into shall we say more involved plot as opposed to thematic setup uh, which is I think what we primarily worked through last time. Uh, joining us to continue our journey as we go from Act 3, uh, Scene 2, into Act 4. Uh, today, uh, reading uh, Adrastus and Chorus in Act 3 is... Rachel, actor on the East Coast. Uh, reading uh, various countrymen, I assume a, a representation of the countrymen. I don't think you have to do all of them simultaneously. Um, uh, Celia and Chorus in Act 4 is... Hi, I'm Greg. I hail from Stratford on Avon, and I really hope that some of these characters stick around for a bit longer tonight. Yeah, you you, you were a bit of a one-hit wonder yesterday, weren't you? Um, <laughs> uh, reading Attis and Sandinus is. Hi, I'm Eric, and as you can see, I'm illuminated but not enlightened. And uh, joining us for the first time, be kind and, and and lovely people. Reading Croesus is. Emily C.A. Snyder, and uh, I'm from America, as you may tell. <laughs> and I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be, I would say I'd be reading stage directions. There are basically no stage directions. I'm basically redundant. You can ignore me for the next two hours. Uh, so we're going to actually just read the very last uh, speech that Croesus uh, makes at the end of the previous scene, because we're, we're in this sort of misery mood. Um, and uh, Croesus is, uh, is worried about uh, uh, about his uh, son Atis, Atis. Um, and so uh, just to let let the flow in a bit before lots of people enter to the scene. So on stage at the moment is Adrastus and Croesus, and I'll ask Croesus to kick us off. I will unto his youth attendance give, which in my age may gird and be again. If it be possible for mortal states to strive against the stars and be more strong, I fortune must unarm and cross the fates by barring both all means to do me wrong. I have commanded under pain of death that no such weapon be within my walls, as I supposed extinguish my, his breath, to scape a storm which oft by fortune falls. He to frequent the fields must oft defer and without guards his lodging never leave. Lo, where with countrymen he doth confer, we will go try what they of him would have. And so the next scene follows straight in uh, as action. Uh, there's a chorus of countrymen. Uh, Croesus remains on stage with Adrastus. Also we have Attis and Celia. Lend. Sir, a willing ear to humble words. Let not our baseness bar us from your grace, which still itself alike to all affords, who bless their sight with that majestic face. For simple subjects, monarchs must take care, though this our state be thought but abject now, you are our head, and we your members are. And, we, and you must care for us, we care for you. Our poverty to us is no reproach which innocently integrity adorns on other states we never do encroach but live by labors pricked with many thorns and ever busied for the country's good we have no time for to muse of vain conceits but earning with continual toil our food must entertain the pomp of prouder states and, sir, though plain, think not our meaning ill, who dare thus, sorry, who does dare speak so freely as we do, whilst mediators do dilate our will. They rest it as they will, and spoil us too. 
To countenance such as us, you need not shun. A great man too well graced may do no, sorry, may do more harm. And it stains not the glory of the sun, though oft his beams an abject object warm. Be not discouraged by your base estate. Ye are my people, and I'll hear your plaint. A king must care for all, both small and great. And to do, and to do good, like God, should never faint. The scepter, such as those, should chiefly shroud, not cottages, but castles spoil the land to spare the humble and to plague the proud a virtue is that doth make kings to stand sir our estate some hasty help requires in missia <sighs> near the celebrated rounds of great olympus which the world admires there haunts a boar the horror of these bounds his body big and hideous in his form, whose foamy jaw with tusks like javelins strikes, and in deformity all parts conform. His back had bristles like to iron pikes. This nature's monster wandered at by men, the forest's tyrant and the country's terror, doth murder all and draws them to his den, who chanced to cross his way by fatal error. In tears, whilst melting tender mother's wail, the gored infants tumbling in their blood. This beast to be abhorred doth them assail, and in his bowels buries both for food. Then when we fly the field where he doth haunt, to have his hunger or his rage a lady, all our labours quickly doth supplant, and poor men's hopes are strangely thus betrayed. Ere this, of true repose we were the types and pasturing on each plain our fleecy flocks did make a consort of our warbling pipes with moving crystals playing on the rocks and oft to ease our toils or ranged in bands with garlands guarded from apollo's beams we gazed upon pactolus's golden sands glassed bathed and quenched our thirst with his pure streams whilst we preferred the river seemed amazed even to his golden bed his grassy bank and lay and looked where as our cattle grazed far from all envy of a greater rank but to repress oppression you take care that we were dumb the public rest may speak your laws like spiders webs are not sorry, are not a snare for little flies that them the big may break Mean men by them from great men's pride are saved. The heavens continue long your prosperous reign, and let us not by such a beast be braved, which by our ruin would your scepter slain. What would you then that should be done by me, that may repay your loss, repair this wrong? We crave none of your wealth, but wish to see this boar be blood the star for the most strong. Let Varus Atis, worthily your son, with Lydian youth incapable of fears, go to the fields before the rising sun to quench his thirst, have drunk the morning's tears, and we shall lead them, crowned with laurel forth, when in strict bounds yet a theatre large for men to make a trial of their worth. They with advantage may this monster charge, so shall we reap repose and they delight, whilst that prodigious body justly smart oh though fearful once then made a pleasant sight when like a wood it planted is with darts i may not spare my son for a respect which is not needful now to be made known but others shall be sent for that effect that this outrageous beast may be o'erthrown the stately gallants who attend our grace that by the world their valor may be viewed, this enterprise will willingly embrace, and not return till with his blood imbrued. I swear, this monster shall, when he is dead, a memorial monument remain. In Phoebe's church men shall admire his head, as Python spoil when by her brother slain. Uh, father, wherein did I thus offend? Or what vile sign of a degenerate mind have you but marked in me, whose course may tend to the reproach of our imperial kind? 
an abject dastard who for naught avails, whose worth the world must trust but never try. As one whose strength or his then his courage fails, must I in vile repose in glorious lie, fly like a wanton by vain thoughts bewitched, who spoiled of force effeminately lives, a peacock poor with painted pens enriched, yet bear of everything that glory gives. What glory give those titles unto me, which by succession fall not by desert? <laughs> Should but my fame with borrowed feathers fly? For come of kings, a kingdom is my part, who honor his hereditary claims, like bastard base, doth but his birthright bloat. I scorn to beg my worth from dead men's names, or to gain credit only by my coat. What comforts this to have the highest seat, and all the bliss that majesty imparts, if those whom we only we exceed in state be superiors in far better parts, more than a crown true worth should be esteemed. The one honors the fortune's gift, the other is our own, by which the mind from anguish is redeemed when fortune's goods are by herself overthrown. I see what brave desires boil in thy soul and make thee thus magnanimous to be this high bent courage nothing can control. All Lydia is not large enough for thee. Go, seek an empire equal with thy mind, of which a crown is due to every thought. But glory's love whilst courting in this kind, I fear by thine our ruin may be wrought. And pardon me, dear son, great is the love which makes me watch so warily thy ways. A father's care what kind of thing can move whom such a danger not in time dismays. The heaven of late advertised me by dreams that some sad fortune threatened thee too soon. Each day some ominous sign attendance claims which out of time are marked when all is done. This was the cause that hastened us so much to have thee bound to Hymen's sacred law. This was the cause that all our care was such, out of our sight, all weapons to withdraw. Scorn not those comets which amazement notes, the stars to mortal states abounds design, and do not think tis but my love that dotes. For if thou fall, my fate depends on thine. Would God I had some means once ere my death to satisfy that infinite desert, which I shall hold so long as I give, I have breath, deep registered with reverence in my heart. Yet, sir, we see this is a natural thing that too excessive love engenders fears. A sport like this can no great peril bring, where either all delights the eyes or the ears, if from my former deeds I should now shrink, as void of virtue, to soft pleasure throw. Of your two sons, what might your subjects think? The one wanting sense, the, the one wanting but one sense, the other all. <laughs> what fancies might my late espoused love possess, to see her husband hateful in men's sights? and honor's bounds thus basely to transgress as womanized to still wallowing in delights. Though women would have men at their devotion, they hate base minds that hatch no noble notion. Well, well, my son, I see thou must prevail. Go, follow forth the chase, use thine own form, yet stay, or let my words thus much avail. Walk with more care to scape this threatened storm, thy haughty sprite to tempt all hazards bent, I fear transports thee to a fatal strife. I wish to err, yet the event prevent, lest that thy courage but betray thy life. And dear Adrastus, I must let him know what benefits I have bestowed on thee, not to upbraid thee, no, but to show how I may trust thee best, thus bound to me. When thou from Phrygia camest defiled with blood and a fraternal violated love, when desperate quite thou as distracted stood, fled from thy father's face, cursed from above, thou foundst me friendly, and my court thy rest, a sanctuary which thy life did save, 
And danger escaped when one hath been distressed. A wary wisdom by experience leave, yet all that favor passed was but a sign of generous greatness which would gracious prove. But in thy hands my soul I'll now consign, and give the greatest pledge that can bind love. Behold, how Attis of our age the shield, whose harm, as you have heard, I feared ere now, is for his pastime to go range the field, and with his custody I will trust you. I must, my friend, even fervently exhort, wait on my son, remember of my dream. This dangerously delectable sport doth make me fear the grief exceeds the game. I never shall those courtesies neglect. It grieves me not to think nor hear the same. For whilst this sprite those members doth direct, all shall concur to celebrate your fame. Yet were you pleased, I would not hence depart, who do all things that mirth may move a poor. But with my passions here retired apart, will past would wail, and shun all cause of more. If to converse where not one cross annoys, I fear my fellowship infect with woe. Those who themselves would recreate with joys, still strange mishaps attend me where I go. But since you will commit this charge to me, your majesty I'll study to content. At least my faith shall from defects be free, and all my pain shall as you please be spent. Now bent to see this monster's ugly shape with an inflamed desire my thoughts do burn. And father, fear not. Dream of no mishap. I, I hope with speed victorious to return. Return? From whence, dear love? O oh, deadly word that doth import thy parting from my sight, I heard the name mishap. Ah, oh, my dear lord, should such cruel limit bound so large delight. O oh, cruel to thyself, unkind to me, and canst thou condescend to leave me so? If e'er in doubt abandoned as I be, it may defer but not defraud my woe. This might indeed to thee yield some relief to have thy ears not wounded by my moan, but would wound me with a continual grief to fear all things where I should fear but one. Desist in time from this intended strife, a course too rash and not approved by me. Remember, I have interest in thy life, which thus I, to venter I do not agree. Hast thou not given a proof in thy green prime that may content the most ambitious heaps? Whilst Attis was his own, then was it time to follow fancy's unconfined scopes? Thyself then can Thyself then only camped in fortune's bounds, thou dost in danger Kalia likewise now. You sigh her breath, she suffers in your wounds, you live in her and she must die in you. Life of my soul, how do such broken speeches from troubled passions thus abruptly arise? I know, my love, thy love, my mind o'erreaches. Affection schooled with fears is too, too wise. I go among, amongst the fields for sport to range. Thy sighs do but my soul with sorrow fill. And pardon, dear, I find this wondrous strange that thou begins now to resist my will. If I trespass in aught against my duty, which makes thee thus my constancy mistrust, mistrust not yet the chains of thine own beauty, which bind all my desires, and so they must. Are we not now made one? Such fears overcome, though I would fly myself, myself do fetter, and if that I would fly, from whom? To whom? I can love none so well, none loves me better. Have pity of those pearls, sweet eyes, soul's pleasures. Least they presage what thou wouldst not have done. The, the heavens had not given me those precious treasures of such perfections to be spoiled so soon. And there we're going to pause before we get to the chorus that closes off the act in uh, uh, typical neoclassical style. Um, but I, I thought I'd let that run without pausing midway uh, to just just get get everyone in in the zone, uh, get get a sense of where we are. Um, 
so yeah, uh, I, I, I think this is this plan is fine. I think nothing can go wrong. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've never seen a, a, any kind of dramatic entertainment where someone has a terrible vision about something awful happening um, and then sending the person off to great and mortal peril. Uh, and, and, and everyone lives happily ever after. That's what always happens. So, um, yeah, I think we can safely say this isn't going to go well. Um, it's like... a. <laughs> Croesus just goes right. Okay, no pointy things. No, everything's bubble wrapped. Everything's going to be fine. And immediately, a load of countrymen come in and say, "Sorry, can we can we commission some sharp pointy thing? There's a there's a problem. There's a problem. Um, you know, I, I'm not saying it's because you banned all the pointy things, but it might be because you banned all the pointy things. Um, and uh, Croesus is uh, probably quite pleased that nobody's asking for subsidies or anything because, you know, he quite likes his money. Um, so, yeah, thoughts in the room uh, about this scene. It's doing a lot of uh, work again. Um, we've got quite a few characters actually b bouncing around. We haven't had this many people in the room at the same time um, in this play. And... Um, yeah, we've uh, we've got an uh, introduction of the son who's been mentioned in passing. We've got these countrymen. Uh, the son's wife as well uh, has, has popped in and uh, also not keen. Um, so, yeah, who wants to who wants to leap in? Wave at me. Who wants who wants to say something? Who has an opinion? Eric. It's interesting how well, basically, it's sort of the typical setup where you kind of go, no, no, don't go. You're going to die. And then obviously the main character or, you know, well, at least the victim is going to go, no, but I must go. It is important. It is my hero's journey. They will remember me. And then obviously they die. Um, I, I'm guessing. He, he <laughs> I might mean, be you fine. know, it might be fine. They, it might all go perfectly fine, you know, I'm just, yeah. But I, I just like, I'm, I'm enjoying the writing just because it's like artists gets all this sort of like, you know, like doubly sort of, um, not layered, but I don't know what the word is. Um, like his priorities are honor and, you know, sort of ambition and how to be remembered, but also love and sort of very courtier-like. That, that's, that's kind of what he's reminding me of. Mm, yeah, there, there's this very formal exchange at, um, uh, between uh, the, 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 that's going on uh, throughout this. We had this sort of bit of this yesterday, um, and the way that people are talking up to power and 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 and, and across statuses um, happening happening throughout. Um, uh, other thoughts? Who wants to leap in? Uh, Emily. Um, I I always start with verse for first, and I was just so intrigued to see the parentheticals throughout this um which which are just so playable which was really exciting um but uh i i was worried because i was trying it beforehand and i was like how much of this is is actable especially since it's a closet drama um and i'm thrilled to see that there's like a lot to play with i'm also really intrigued that crisis is not as much an overt jerk as I would have expected him to be drawn. Mm. Um, uh, it, it, although it's it's odd that there's no stage direction. It's like halfway through I'm talking to Addis and then suddenly I'm I'm talking to my friend and suddenly other people are just there. And so there's some questions I have of staging in terms of do people come in? What do people hear? When do the peasants leave? Are they listening to this conversation mm. between the family? Um, which is entirely possible. Um, but there's, it's, there's a lot more subtle, um, character drawing in Croesus than I had expected. It's not just fairy tale. I, sh I am this way. Um, there's, there's different tactics of like, well, can we do this? And it's not going to work. Okay. How about this? Do you really need pointy things? Let me send other people. Let me send da 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 da. Let me send this. Um, he's, he's a bit of a jolly con man is what it feels like from the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we found this with with a lot of um, uh, closet drama or, or 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 in that area where you know you look at the script and you see these massive long speeches and you go, oh dear God, please no. Um, <laughs> and actually, the, it it does it does work a lot of the time. And the, the, uh, we were very pleasantly surprised yesterday, actually, and uh, and and we seem to be very much in, the scenes are very playable. That we mm. have got character. We have got. It's not just here is a here is an obtuse 
point that we're going to debate. You know, right. there is something at stake. Well, uh, the only thing I would say is, you know, like my kingdom for a shared line. <laughs> I would love to to have a bit of back and forth. Um, and I don't know if the fact that it's a closet drama and also the fact that it's in rhyming quatrains kind of inhibits that as you're writing it, everyone needs to finish their sentence. Um, why would you, you know, give up half your sentence? You've got a rhyme. You started speaking with four rhymes in mind. You've got to finish your four rhymes. Ah, I did. well, you, you say that. It, it's amazing what, what terrible damage you can do to the verse when you actually pull it on stage. Um... <laughs> Um, I mean, that's the thing. Remember, we can we can do whatever we like with the script as well. So it's uh, 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 it's and across different mediums as well. So um, you've you've got all the toys in the box to uh, to say what we do with this. Um, the uh, the other thoughts in the room. Rachel, I think was waving. Um... Yeah, uh, I, I have another point. But to what Emily said, I I think maybe the countrymen being in there. This could be a this could be playing out in the middle in front of, uh, you know, the court, uh, this personal family drama. Um, but uh, I think there's such a, this scene like moves like a wave in a way, um, in a very subtle way, I think too, because yesterday we had that opening where it's completely to the audience. Um, and so I think that there is some really veiled political stuff that's being said here and these countrymen coming in looking for sharp things after sharp things have been made illegal um i think that talks about some some underlying unrest in this country that there's more going on than just what's going on in this um room uh and that uh, I wonder if it's it's something like, you know, peasant revolts or that fear of peasant revolts, uh, you know, and it's, I don't know, something like in America, we have the Second Amendment and there's all those people who are die hard on that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know, it's it smells like something of like civil war, like the wounds of civil war before that breaks out. And then you have him cutting off his uh, one son that he acknowledges as as an heir and uh tells him to go somewhere else so it's like he's dismantled this country without a civil war and there's some uh maybe unrest and i say that that boar thing because uh uh you know uh what was it two tragedies in one we had that analogy with the hunt you know that that analogy with the hunt and the killing of a king uh in a hunt hmm uh, yeah. Uh, other other thoughts in the room? Uh, anyone want to uh, bounce off anything um, uh, and stuff? I, I, I want to uh, bounce off on uh, some things that Emily was saying on uh, that that question of who is on uh, stage, who is talking to who, who is hearing things. Um, it just sort of intersects a bit with Rachel's point there as well. You know, uh, what is the wider political uh, drama that's going on here? Um, uh, you know. Because that, that question of private voice and public voice, you know, how much of it is, yes, I will say this in front of the people. And, and, you know, and, and, uh, and that question of, you know, Cre Croesus at the very beginning when he's, you know, being either very diplomatic or really patronizing uh, 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 to, to the people who've come to him, um, you know, uh, who are all tugging their forelocks remarkably hard. Um, so it's, it, yeah, the, the, there's all sorts of questions that are in play in this. Um, I say, and also for those who weren't here yesterday, you know, coming straight out of this, a very private scene, a two-hander scene that that followed, uh, you know, it follows directly on the, the the scene division is just just an admin note for the script, um, and uh, and and not if an actual if uh, a meaningful break. Um, other thoughts um, before we go into the chorus, the close, the act, Eric, uh, and then Greg. Yeah, the, like you were talking about, like how people talk up to power and down to other people and so on and so forth. It's interesting how, you know, um, as Emily said, the crisis is very sort of, you know, take something else. Many options are available. You don't have to have this one. Uh, and then sort of Atis kicks in with his like, you know, oh, father, you know, that kind of thing. But then Celia comes in or. Kalia? I don't know. I, I keep wanting to call her Celia because that makes more sense to me, but anyway, maybe that's just... Um, and 
it like that moment of like, yes, I will return. Uh, wait, you, where are you going to come back from? And she's like, sort of, it just becomes very intimate very quickly in, in front of like so many people. Uh, I don't know, it's just very, very interesting. <laughs> like, it's like zooming in and zooming out again and then zooming back in. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, Greg and then Emily. Um... Uh, two things. I thought the... Um... Three things. Right? I thought it was very interesting, the chorus. I I thought, oh, dear. And then it was like, I thought it was going to be the typical countrymen who are whatever. But actually, it was a really nice device of them bringing in the um, the plot device of the war. And I thought in its own little world, those two or three speeches were absolutely fabulous. I love the description of the war. Mm, yeah, this the na- back hath bristles like to, uh, to iron pikes. Um, you know, I, I, we were throwing references into the chat. You know, you can see that. Uh, you know, and the great thing, you know, on putting on stage. You know, this is where the shadow pl- puppet uh, st- uh, puppetry comes in, and the the back projection, and you you can oh, it looked fabulous. You, you know, yes. you can do all sorts of things when you've got images like this. You can actually do stuff with um, Emily. Oh, sorry, Greg, you had more. That's right, you? No, if you're all right, if I can. Yeah. Um, secondly, um, Kayla, Kayla, Kayla will make a decision by the end of the play. Um, I I don't think she was there at the start. That really, her first line really feels like a, she's only entered just early enough to have heard a little bit of what happened. Because she only really picks up on um, Atticus's last line. And thirdly, I've obviously been doing too much of this because yes, I just feel I feel like we're going we're going to range into um, and this is from previous weeks, Tancred and Gizmond the territory where everything is going to go horribly wrong. <laughs> Indeed, there's furies in the basement and in the in the attic. I think in this play. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. I know. I, I absolutely agree on the yeah the the the, the Celia Kalia um entrance that it's 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 late in the day and that does sort of suggest that the countrymen having got their answer go and then we get they go into admin details, um you know they go to Adrastus and say right okay, so w- just just to be clear you have one job, um this is your job and uh, th- nothing will go wrong there uh Emily. Uh, yeah, um, just thinking about further about staging, uh, and I love the fact that you're thinking of shadow puppets, this, that, or the other. But it's okay. So two things. One, I have a friend who who has a friend who has theorized that the rise of closet drama helped to give rise to more stage direction, because there would be no director, so you may as well write it in so that someone would imagine what might possibly be happening, since it wouldn't necessarily be performed um and and i wonder because it's so odd with this this moment where essentially he's moving us to different like if this were a film this would very easily be different cut scenes we would just move to second location we have outdoor location we have indoor location and um i I was looking up a little bit about alexander it seems that like many courtiers he may have been more of a writing hobbyist Mm. um and so he doesn't necessarily like he doesn't have practical experience of just having to shuffle on an entire chorus and shuffle off an entire chorus mm. and um, cover that up with with someone saying like, I prithee go or whatever it may be. Um, it, literally just to give time for, for someone to physically get their body out the door. And so in some ways this is being written cinematically where you could just do a cut and person disappears. Mm. A cut and person appears. Um, so it's just it's it's interesting to me that closet dramas uh, sometimes forget the mechanics of the stage, even as they're written technically for the stage. Yeah, uh, and you know we've got so many just sort of different classes of of. Uh, we're talking about sort of neoclassical drama, which we've done quite a lot of, uh, where, where which are in this style but may have been staged. Uh, and then you have a sort of at uh, this end of the state where we're sort of going, where we don't really think that Alexander actually had any interest in actually doing these. Um, and but 
weirdly that sort of makes it potentially more modern and it's sort of this sort of uh, in, in thinking uh, of going well we don't want well, that's the director or figure of that out um, I just do the words man um, Eric uh, yeah I just do the words man no um, yeah it's kind of I was going to say that um, well in terms of staging I, I can kind of imagine this as like you know you start off like sort of lighting like you would do this all with lighting, I think, on on a stage, um, sort of um, focusing in on. Uh, obviously, in a film, it would be different, but like for, you know, you would have like general lighting up for them, and then sort of as you sort of as each group starts to speak, uh, you just kind of snap the light to them, and then at, when um, Celia comes in at the end, it you know it just snaps to the two of them at the front of the stage, and it becomes this very intimate moment between the two of them, and then chorus, and you're like, okay, <laughs> um, or I don't know, maybe the chorus comes up from somewhere else, because uh, obviously chorus would not be one person. Unfortunately, we do not have that luxury, so yeah. Yeah, they could be. They could be a you know, representative of chorus. Um, you know, ideas of what a chorus should be like is uh, is distanced because it's all coming by Seneca anyway. So, um, you know, they're, they're 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 coming from this this idea. It could be just one one person with a with a good cloak. Um, uh, Rachel, were you waving? Yeah, um, it's back to the point that we moved on a little bit from, but. Uh, I, how we were talking about that public and private voice coming together in this scenario, I think it would be like, and, and also people, how much do they hear and they don't hear? Uh, if you're staggering people coming in, it would be wonderful for when there's fewer people on stage or maybe just wonderful to try and see what the levels of it would look like on stage, uh, that the fewer people there are on stage towards the beginning of the scene, that it's very public, even though it there's fewer people, but the more people who come in, the more uh, unintentionally personal it becomes and the more, um, yeah, it, it unwinds. Well, in, in, the, in the sort of way that sometimes people um, uh, express themselves more openly when they've got an audience um, in, 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 in that sort of way and, and or. No, I mean, I mean, more like when you're at a public restaurant, and you're sitting there and then it's like, oh, you wind up sitting next to that couple who's uh, maybe going through a breakup or something. I, there's like a modern version of uh, Medea where uh, I, I saw these uh, two people doing it. It's like a, 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 a couple, a fancy couple, an uh, Upper East Side couple, and they're having this fight at a restaurant uh, in New York City, just at a table, waiting for the waiter to come with the glasses. That it's, you know, you imagine you're sitting next to these people who inadvertently had some very private altercation in public and you're just there with your ear to the <laughs> with your ear to the wall that isn't between you. Uh, excellent. Right. We will uh, conclude the act because uh, I, I paused before the chorus uh, and the chorus is uh, see what the job of this chorus is doing. Uh, choruses do vary from play to play, um, uh, either recapping themes or uh, admonishing uh the the action on stage uh, depends how judgy the chorus turns out to be uh let's find out what this chorus is up to uh so chorus for act three please those who command above high presidents of heaven by whom all things do move as they have order given what worldling can arise against them to repine whilst Castelled in the skies with province divine, they force this peopled round their judgments to confess and in their wrath confound proud mortals who transgress the bound to them assigned by nature in their mind, base brood of the earth, vain man. Why brackst thou of thy might? The heavens thy courses scan, thou walk'st still in their sight. Ere thou wast born, thy deeds, their registers dilate, and think that none exceeds the bounds ordained by fate. 
what heavens would have thee to, though they thy ways abhor, that thou of force must do, and thou canst do no more. This reason would fulfill their work, should serve their will. Are we not heirs of death, in whom there is no trusts, who tossed with restless breath, are but a dam of dust? Yet fools, when as we err, and heavens do wrath contract, if they a space defer, just vengeance to exact, pride in our bosom creeps, and informs us thus that Jove in pleasure sleeps or takes no care of us. The eye of heaven beholds what every heart enfolds. The gods digest no crime, though they, delaying long in the offender's time, seem to neglect a wrong till others of their race fill up the cup of wrath, whom ruin and disgrace long time attended hath. And Gyg's fault we fear to cry to crisis charge belayed, which love will not forbear, though it be long delayed. For, oh, sometimes the gods must plague sin with sharp rods, and lo, how Croesus still tormented in his mind, like two reeds on a hill, doth quake at every wind. Each step a terror brings. Dreams do by night afflict him, and by day many things. All his thoughts do convict him. He his star would control. This makes ill not the worst, whilst he wounds his own soul. With apprehensions first, man may his fate foresee, but not shun heaven's decree. Mm, some interesting uh, stuff in there. Sh much shorter verse line, um, quite fleet of foot. Um, a wee dram of dust there. Um, I... <laughs> um yeah um it's 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 to the point which is nice i, li I like a chorus that is largely to the point um uh, thoughts in the room uh briefly on this uh rachel uh i know this is supposed to take place in lydia um but because this is in the neoclassical style and we have that uh what do you call it it's not the the four syllables per line one i forget what those are called uh that we had uh in in that robin hood but um because they're so short i wonder if you could have um i wonder if you could have like hermes deliver this speech because the i don't know just the quickness of the lines and that he's the yeah, it's it's it it it's uh, it's a tricksy one. Um, it it it's it's not skeletonics, but uh, yes, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, uh, it is it is doing a different job. Um, other thoughts in the room? Um, who wants to leap in, Emily? Uh, yeah, just sort of. Um, I found myself. Well, one second. I just realized I've got something going. There we go. Now it'll be quieter. <laughs> um, what I found is that I, as an audience member, kind of tuned out in the middle mm. and um, really came back in on that lovely for, oh, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? What? Yes. Hello. Mm. I'm here. Um, and I find just sort of dramaturgically, the only part of the speech that I think I need is from the for, oh, down to the end, mm. which basically is like, if you do not know how dramatic irony and hubris works, let us fill you in. <laughs> um <laughs> Because everything above it um, is fine. Actually, if I could briefly say, I'm actually really impressed with this playwright that by and large, he doesn't stay in the same thought over and over and over again. He keeps moving the thought along. Mm. Um, but but I don't know that he succeeded in this chorus. Yeah, it, 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 and it, it's something about doing courses in the, in the, in this form uh it does make it very very hard to hold on to the thought um it it's it's structurally very very hard um uh, and there may be something in performance that can be uh, done to give that that a bit more oomph but it's uh it, it's a tricky one it's a tricky one um eric I don't know if you're waving or you're just. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to decide whether it's anything or not. Um, there's a uh, um, has Gaigi's or I don't know how you want to pronounce it uh, been uh, been mentioned before or not? I, I mean, I mean so. in the text. I don't think Cause... so. Um, we've had very very few actual classical references uh, coming in anywhere. 
Uh, mm-hmm. It's been very, very sparse. So, uh, which is always nice when you you're not sitting there going, "Hang on, I just need to look up which 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 who who we're talking about now." Um, <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a yeah. We've had very little of that. Yeah, he's well. In some versions, he's obviously because you know they like to name people the same way. Um, uh, he's an ancestor in Lydia and so on and so forth um, of Croesus, but also kind of in one of Plato's stories, Gyges is a character who like desires a ring, kind of like the one true ring of power and so on and so forth um, that will bring him wealth and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Cool. Just, yeah, dropping that. <laughs> Not relevant, but, you know, no, no. Well, uh, associations and uh, are, are, are all uh, good because you know we're we're here to see what the possible implications of the dialogue, even if they're not intended implications of the dialogue. Uh, so uh, all 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 grist to the mill. Uh, we need to crack on. However, I've uh, I've allowed us to linger too long, so let's uh, dive deep into Act Four. Um, we have within this scene coming up Adrastus. Croesus and the chorus. The chorus is actually going to be engaged with dialogue. Uh, different chorus uh, for Act 4. Uh, so let's see how Act 4 Scene 1 functions. I have no idea who enters when. Can heaven behold one stand to stain these times, yet to the Stygian streams not headlong hurled? And can the earth bear one burdened with such crimes as may provoke the wrath of all the world? Why sends not Jove to have my course confined, a death denouncing flash of rumbling thunder, else roaring terror, clouds of circling wind, by violence to tear me all asunder? What corner yet unknown, a from men removed? both burned with rage and freezing in despair shall i go now possess to be approved where none but monsters like myself repair i'll go indeed whom all the world detests who have no interest in the fields of bliss and barbarize amongst the brutish beasts where tigers rage toads spew and serpents hiss and though in some vast zone i find a field where melancholy might a monarch be whilst silent deserts not one person yield to shrink for horror well, when beholding me. Yet of my deeds, which all the world do tell, this cannot raise the still proclaimed scroll, since in my breast I bear about my hell and cannot scape the terrors of my soul, those fearful monsters of confusing aspect, Chimera, Gorgon, Hydra, Pluto's apes, which in the world wrought wonderful effect and borrowed from the infernal shades their shapes, their devilish forms which did to the world amaze, not half so monstrous as myself I find, when on mine own deformities I gaze amidst black depths of a polluted mind. No, but my mind untainted untainted still remains my thoughts in this derelict have had no part which but by accidents this foul fact stains my hands have no commission from my heart yet whether it was fortune or my fate or some hell hag that did direct my arm the Lydian's plague, I have undone this state, and am the instrument of all their harm. Then mountains fall, and bruise me by your rounds. Your heights may hide me from the wrath of heaven, but not this not needs, since me my faults confounds. With my offense no torment can be even. Ah! Of what desert shall I now make choice to fly the countenance of an angry king? I know the venging sword of Crassus' voice. To wound my soul, hosts of rebukes doth bring. The pattern of distress, I'll stand alone. A memorable monster of mishap. For though Pandora's plagues all in one, all were too few, so vile a wretch to trap. Oh, how the king is moved at Attis's death. 
his face the portrait of a passion bears, with bended eyes, crossed arms, and quithering breath, his princely robe he desperately tears. Lo, with a silent pity pleading look, which shows with sorrow mixed a high disdain, he, whilst his soul seems to dissolve in smoke, stays twixt the corpse and him who it hath it slain. Thou ruthless tyrant mine of my bliss, and didst thou so disguise thy devilish nature to recompense my courtesies with this? <sighs> Cruel wretch, abominable creature, thy tigrish mind, what wit could well detect, immortal breast so great barbarity? What froward sprite could but such spite suspect in hospitality, hostility? Did I revive thee when thy hopes were dead, as when when as thy life thy parents had not spared, and he having heaped such favours on thy head, is this, is this? He would say the reward. I grant what you allege and more is true. I have unto the height of hatred run, a blood-stained wretch who merit not to view the rolling circles nor the ray sun. No kind of art I purpose now to use to color this my crime, which might seem less whilst painted with a pitiful excuse. No, it is worse than words can well express, nor go I thus to aggravate my crime and damn myself to be absorbed by others. No. No such rhetoric comes out of time. I'll not survive his death as heirs to my brothers. Oh, had that high disaster killed me straight, as then indeed I died from all delight. I had not groaned, charged with this inward weight, but slept with shadows in eternal night. Yet must I die at last, though late, grown wise. This in my mind most discontentment breeds. A thousand torturing deaths cannot suffice, to play condignly for so heinous deeds, if that revenge the Elysian guests delights. The tomb of Attis shall exhaust my blood, no fitter offering for infernal sprites than one in whom, th than one in whom they reigned. Well, as he stood, the furies oft in me infused their rage, and in my bosom did their serpents place, whose indignation laboring to assuage Huge hellish horrors spoiled my thoughts of peace. I find, poor wretch, when I have searched and seen the fatal means which did inflict this wound, that not thy malice, but my fault hath been, of that which grieves us both the real ground, whilst barely with a superficial wit we weigh the outside of such strange events. If but the mediate means our judgments hit, we seek not the first cause that much contents. But when prodigious accidents fall out, though they amaze our minds, and so they must, the cause of all comes from ourself, no doubt. Ah, man hath erred. The heavens are always just. In judgment now whilst entering with my soul those partial thoughts which flattered me declined. Lo, marking of past wrongs the burdenous scroll, free from false colors which did mock my mind. Oh, then I see how heaven in plagues exceeds, whilst vengeance do save ruin not can end. Thus once the gods must balance worldling deeds, both what we did and what we did intend son son my faults procured have they thy fall for guilty of thy blood i gave the wound which gave thee death and whose remembrance shall my life each day with many com deaths confound of jove in just the statutes i condemn and if I were confronted with the gods, their providence as partial would condemn, who in such sort do exercise their rods. He thus now killed with life to let me go, may breed reproach to all the powers divine, but ha, ah, they knew no death could grieve me so as that which through his heart was aimed at mine. 
Now all the world who those deities may despise which strike the guiltless and the guilty spare. Cease, hapless man, to plague thyself thus wise. I pardon thee and pity thy despair. Oh, rigorous judgment, oh, outrageous fate. Must I survive the funerals of my fame? All things which I behold abrade my state. Too many monuments of one man's shame, all and none more than I my deeds detest. Yet some wail want of friends and I of foes to purge the world of such a dangerous pest which still contagious must taint hearts with woes to wound this breast where all hell's host do reign seized with just fear none dare a hand forth stretch else this base charge as odious do disdain to deal with death in favor of a wretch or must i yet till more detested stand and fill the world with horror of my name what further mischief can require my hand? Must it engrave on others' graves my shame? Or would some bastard thought for life's cause debate, which in the blasted field of comfort gleams? No, no, in spite of heaven all force my fate. One, when resolved to die, cannot want means. Proud tyrant death, and must thou make it strange? to wrap my wearied soul in further strife, unless my courage with my fortune change, though nothing else, I can command my life. But this, I me, all hope of help devours. What gains my soul by death in those sad times, if potent still in all her wanted powers, she must remember of my odious crimes. What though unbodied she the world forsake, yet from her knowledge cannot be divorced. This will but vex her at the shadowy lake, till even to groan the god of ghosts be forced, but welcome death, and would the gods I had less fame, or more fortunately lived, than known if good, and kept obscure if bad. Of comfort quite I had not been deprived. Ah. Uh, had I lived to see my lady die, and die for me, whose faith she never proved. <sighs> Had I lived a natural eye to be my brother's murderer, who me dearly loved. Ah, had I lived with my own hands to kill a gallant prince committed to my charge. And do I gaze on the dead body still? And in his father's sight, my shame enlarge. Ah, have I lived whilst men my deeds do scan to be the object of contempt and hate? Have all abhorred as a most monstrous man, since thought a traitor or far worse, ingrate. Yet with my blood, I'll wash away this stain which grief to you, to me disgrace, hath brought. Would God my name from mines might raised remain to make my life as an unacted thought. Brave Addis, now I come to plead for grace, although thou frownst on my affrighted ghost, and to revenge thy wrong this wound embrace. Thus, thus, I toil to gain the Stygian coast. Lo, oh, how he wounds himself, despising pain, with leaden lights, weak legs and head declined. The body beats the ground as in disdain that of her members one have proved unkind. The fainting hand falls trembling from the sword, with his sorry, with this self-slaughtering blow for shame grown red, which straight the blood pursues with vengeance store to drown the same with the same floods it shed. Who of those parties can the sorry, yeah. who of those parties can the combat show where both but one won both stroke and and sustained, or who triumphs for this most strange or throw, whereas the victor lost, the vanquished gained. 
Cursed eyes! What sudden change hath drowned your lights and made your mirthful objects mournful now? Ye that were still inured to stately sights, since seated under an imperial brow, ah, clouded now with vapors drawn from cares, are low thrown down amidst a hell of grief, and have no prospect but my soul despairs. Of all the furies which afflict me, chief, oh, dead, Adrastus, I absolve thy ghost, whose hand I see some destiny did charm. Thou, hated by the heavens, wast to thy cost a casual actor not intending harm. No doubt some angry god hath laid this snare, and whilst thy purpose was the boar to kill, did intercept thy shaft amidst the air, and threw it at my son against thy will. Ah, son, must I be witness of thy death, who view thee thus by violence to bleed, and yet want one on whom to pour my wrath, to take just vengeance for so vile a deed, this wretch whose guiltless mind hath cleared his hand, lo, for his error grieved, unforced doth fall, and not as one who did in danger stand, for he, for still he lived, <laughs> till I forgave him all. Thus have I but the heavens, on whom I may blast forth the tempest of a troubled mind, and in my soul's distress I grieve to say that greater favor I deserved to find. The scene doesn't end there, but it sort of ends there as we have somebody else entering in, in a moment, possibly. Um, once again, we have that question of who is on when. Does Croesus exit and then come back on again and discover the body? Uh, the chorus who, uh, at that latter end, sort of, it's almost like it's the voiceover that's been written uh, for that moment of going, uh, 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 it, it, again, we're going in sort of, film and 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 uh, and and audio sort of uh, c conventions here for the chorus um and this this act is doing a very different thing it's really striving for effect at the beginning it's really re you know it's that that thing of how do you write this kind of horror and despair you know is there a body on stage have they got a beer that has been brought on with the the you know what, what it's it's creating all sorts of options as to what this looks like but it's yeah doing very different things with the the, the language it's really much more pointy and uh, and alliterate and uh, and 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 more mangly it's really harder to 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 get your your, your chops round um than the last act which felt so smooth it felt like everyone was just picking it up and just it was just rolling quite quite nicely um and that's that question you know that's sort of the effect i think the the playwright is trying to get at um and you know with rehearsal is it going to be fine um you know and uh cuz i say it, it it feels like it's leaning very much into some of the uh, the, the more bombastic uh, style <laughs> There's a lot more uh, low R ah, and O's going on. Um, enough for a, 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 a full-blooded uh, piece of pornography. Um, sorry, uh, I'm going down down market there. Rachel, uh, say save me from myself. No, no. Uh, uh, I was just gonna. Uh, some so, like this is all neoclassical, but even if it's all written in that this style you know with the long speeches and not just the setting um there's some things like the um like the the scene that took place in court and the opening that seemed to break with that style and seemed to be a, a slightly more not modern in terms of our modern but modern to that era as opposed to like neoclassical with the interactions and the way that the scene seems to be flowing, um, or those scenes seem flowing, or the way that they're th that something was going on in them that was different, like the way that he was treating the the verse was, you know. And then this just goes full on um, for that neoclassical that um, all the, sending all the language up and and you know hitting that alliteration and hitting all this 
rhyme and uh yeah it's yes, it's 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 not just that. It's also we start getting, you know, we get a list of of oh, Chimera, Gorgon, Hydra. You know, it's suddenly we're like, let's just unpack a few a few uh, uh, tropes that we we can we can you know hang our hat on there. Um, but uh, just just that just just for that one moment, we're not going to go all the way through. Uh, other possible monsters are available, um, but let's not go into them too much. Greg, are you waving? And then uh, Emily. Not waving with drowning. Um, yeah, I, I was really. I, I feel like the chorus change is a very changeable beast. I think if I was staging this, I'd actually. And, and we've done. We did this with Tancred. Not Tancred. Uh, one of them makes make them different people. Because mm. I think though it, though you've done it for um, for other reasons this week, I actually think the, they're very different beasts as you go through the play, especially this one. I was saying in the chat. I felt like I was a Greek chorus in an ancient Greek play saying, this is what's happened off stage. Mm. Well, weirdly, with the person stood there <laughs> on stage with me, so theoretically, anyway. Yeah, it's uh, almost it like really live commentary, odd. isn't it? Yeah, and it was just like, this doesn't make sense, but it's a, a, but it's a really interesting play on the old trope of, um, well, everything happens there. You can't see Oedipus blinding himself, <laughs> but I'm going to give you all the details. Yeah, it's just the way you know. Oh, how the the king is moved at at his death. Um, I did and... feel like a BBC presenter at the same time doing that sort of <laughs> funeral of the queen mum and the queen is. <laughs> yes. His face, the portrait of passion, bears with bended eyes, crossed arms, and quivering breath. His <laughs> princely robe, he desperately tears <laughs> low with a silent pity, pity pleading look etc so uh emily <laughs> amazing <laughs> that was beautiful um yeah it's it's interesting that this scene the text there was so much stumbling words seemed small words seemed to be not quite in the right place in the line it it felt like so there was a lot of going back for like Oh, where did he put the word still? I would have put it here. He put it here. Um, and and um, the alliteration in, in some ways, like, because there was so much alliteration in this scene and it kind of wasn't helping, which is weird. Um, but I was just looking at like Croesus's first speech here. And it's curious because it, it goes from five to four to five to five to six to five to four. Like it's all over the place in terms mm. of its beat which i think works um uh, because like just in terms of inside the character i'm like oh croesus is cool like i would love to play this character for real because he sounded like certain other mad kings railing at gods um that's always fun um i i did have a question as we've been talking about um who can hear who because i found um when Adrastus, however we're saying it, um, has yet another I am a monster, I am a monster <laughs> type speech, um, I felt as Croesus uh, rather um, out of it, like I was only half hearing. Um, mm. And then, but when I come back in to, to pardon my friend, um, clearly I must have overheard what sounded like originally like a very long monologue to side. Um, I must have heard and been affected by it. And again, yeah, questions of like, is the body here? Do I stay here? How much do I hear? Do I watch this death scene? Mm. Is that happening on stage? Um, I, there's, there's a sense as well, because I know that Alexander wrote a Julius Caesar. I wonder how much it's got the same sort of feelings, because there is there's kind of an interesting unmoored feeling from inside the character of Croesus that all of this could be happening with no one ever leaving the stage, mm. almost like a memory play mm. and having to relive these things, the chorus almost being like some way to step back from the horror of what you've just seen, mm. you know, what you've experienced perhaps. Um, so I don't know, I guess I'm getting intrigued 
I would also say the only other thing versically is that um, I found I oh this was it. Um, Creases is doing so many more in jammed end linings where like the the end of the rhyme at the end of the line actually continues into the next sentence and you kind of have to push them through and um it's doing all the things that good verse should do where i'm like ah oh, yes ooh i feel faster i feel you know like it's slowing me down it's speeding me up and um so i just want to guess say well done alexander although i don't know if he knew what he was doing but well done regardless <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're going to give him the benefit of the doubt, uh, the, the, but we shall see. We shall see. Um, you know, if it, if it continues, then we'll uh, we'll say he's done it deliberately. Uh, once we've looked at it, looked at his oeuvre, as it were, um, we don't always look at everybody's oeuvre. Um, it's 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 considered impolite. Uh, Eric. <laughs> yes, it is very no. Uh, yeah, uh, I was going to say that the. Um... It's interesting how there aren't really any dumb shows in this, mm -hmm. which is what we usually get in neoclassical style things like Tancred and Gismunda or, you know, Misfortunes of Arthur, which we've mentioned and that kind of thing. Um, it's like it seems to be covered mainly by the chorus, which is like sort of describing things, as, as Greg said, as they happen. Mm. Um but uh, what was what I found interesting was like that the description of um, I think it was Adrastus going yes where the tigers uh, rage and toads spew and serpents hiss and like there was a part of me going is this a comedy have I stepped into the wrong play because <laughs> like there's a description of, like that that very description of like toads hissing and so on and so forth spewing um is it sounds like a lift from aristophanes frogs <laughs> it's like because there's there's a comedy servant in that uh and uh you know he's complaining about all the random stuff they find on the, on the way to this you know battle of the philosophers anyway that's irrelevant but yeah it's i just like the idea that it's like yes we, we shall have some fun in the middle of this of this tragedy um yeah and I, also, I find it interesting that Chris does not do the thing of punish him, kill him. Mm. Uh, he, he, he does this thing of like, forgive him and he will live with his guilt to the end of his. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it has, has to be said, there does seem to be a, a, a sort of, a, a, you know, Chris sh should really know ultimately he does bear the ultimate responsibility for this. He he sort of kind of organised it. Um, yeah, uh, I, absolutely. I, 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 yeah, I suspect that the, the some of the striving for effect that is going on here in trying to really heighten the language is is, is not quite landing, and that might need to be fixed um, in performance. Um, but you know, we we know it's there, and uh, that 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 is cool. Uh, very briefly, Rachel, and then we'll move on. Um, I, w you know, because if you were putting this on for an audience, they wouldn't be that familiar with this play potentially, unless they were, you know, academics with an interest uh, in this, uh, that potentially for the staging, you could have this like he is about to be executed. Um, and uh, then he flips the script and he, you know, kills himself. I mean, it would be an uh, interesting little thing to contextualize it. Like, um, what do you call it? Like, even though this isn't taking place uh, in the UK, uh, 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 setting-wise, play-wise, maybe you could also have that that letters, what is it, that, Hel that, that Helen brings up sometimes, they, they would read that thing, you know, and maybe he was going to get that pardon for this, you know, the, the king, but he's killed himself. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all going on. It's all going on. Uh, we have a chunky scene to almost complete the act. We're not quite going to the end, um, but we're almost going to complete the act. Uh, and we... I don't know whether this is a continuation. I'm assuming it is. We know that in the next scene, uh, we have two speakers uh, coming up. We have uh, Croesus still, and we have Sandinus or uh, something like that. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, the chorus has exited or remains on stage. I don't know if other people remain uh, end on stage and other people turn up later on. Um, so uh, it's all um, it's all a bit confusing. So uh, anyway, we're just going to let it 
get, let it flow. Let it flow. See what happens. So, Act 4, Scene 2, uh, Sandness uh, and Croesus initially. Why spend you, sir, with sighs that princely breath whence sovereignty or authority should take? Oh, weak revenge for one when wronged by death to yield him homage prostrated in black. That tyrant pale, so hateful unto us whose fatal shaft so great a grief hath bred, where he triumphs should you re rear, should you, where he triumphs should you rear trophies thus, and where his livery as his captive led. No, though he might this outward bliss overthrow, and you, save you, of all things else might spoil, yet whilst of one who yields, no sign you show. You are victorious, and he gets the foil. <laughs> Those floods of sorrow which would drown your soul in breasts more base might be excused, since wanting sprites their passions to control, as from their birth still to subjection used. But you, in whom high thoughts by nature grow to this decay, how is your virtue come? I blush to see my sovereign brought so low, and majestic by misery overcome. Oh, nor do I thus to make you stupid strife, as one unnatural one sense to smart. No, no, <laughs> none of friends of kindness can deprive. The honored badge of an heroic heart, that power supreme by which great states do stand, affection's order should, but not undo. And I could wish you might yourself command, which though you may not well, you yet seem to do. I will not here rehearse enlarging woes, on what just reasons now my grief I ground but still will entertain my comfort's foes, and whilst many a thousand thoughts my soul do wound. What pensive pencil ever limbed aright the sad conceits of soul-consuming grief? Huh. Words are weak to show the swelling height of the inward anguish desperate of relief. Though many monarchs jealously despise the rising sun that in their declining stains, and hate the air who by their fall must rise, as grieved to hear of death or other reigns. My love to Aetis otherwise appeared, whom whilst for him I did my cares engage. I, as a father loved, as a king not feared, the comfort, not the encumbrance of mine age. And had he me, as reason would, survived, who glanced and vanished like to lightning flashes, <laughs> then death could not have me of life deprived, with such a phoenix had revived my ashes. Let not those woes eclipse your virtue's light. Ha! Rage and grief must once be at a height. Strive of your sorrows, sir, to stop the source. These salt eye floods must flow and have their course. That is not kingly. And yet it's kindly. Where passions domineer, they govern blindly. Such woeful plaints cannot repair your state. Unhappy souls, at least, may wail their fate. The meanest comfort that you can return is in calamity a leave to mourn. What stoic strange who most precise appears would that you, could that youth's death with tearless eyes behold in all perfections ripe the green years, a, a hoary gut judgment under locks of gold. No, no man lives but must lament to see the world's chief hope even in the blossom choked. But men cannot control the heaven's decree, and what is done can never be revoked. Let not this loss with grief to torment you more, of which a part with you your country bears. If wailing could your ruined state restore, our souls charged with grief should sail in seas of tears, lest all our comfort dash against one shelf, and his time untimely death but hasten yours. Have pity of your people, spare yourself, if not to your own use, then yet unto ours. When, St. Danis, I first thy faith did find, thou dive so deeply in my bosom then, that since thou still entrusted with my mind, didst know what I concealed from other men. Behold, I go to open up to you, chief treasurer of all my secrets still, what high design my thoughts are hatching now, a physic in some sort to ease my ill. This may unto my soul yield some relief, and for displeasures past may much content, 
or else must purchase partners in my grief, if not for me, yet with me to lament. This benefit must bind me with the rest to serve your majesty and hold you dear. And I'll be free with you, yet I protest that what I friendly speak, you freely hear. Since it hath not pleased the heavenly powers, that of my offspring I might comfort claim. Yet lest the ravenous course of flying hours should make a prey of my respected name, I would engender such a generous brood that the unborn might know how might that the unborn might know how I have lived. And this no doubt would do my ghost great good by famous victories to be revived. I hope to soar with fame's immortal wings, unless my high-bent thoughts themselves deceives, that having acted admirable things, I death may scorn, triumphing o'er the grave, yet I have not so settled my conceit that all opinions are to be despised. A good advice can never come too late. This is the purpose that I have devised. Some Scythian shepherds, in a high disdain, as trusted fame yet constantly relates, to plague some Medes with horror and with pain, did entertain them with, pros with prodigious meats, and to content their more than tigrish witches, they with the infant's flesh the parents fed who not suspecting such polluted dishes, did in their bowels bury whom they bred. Then, after this abominable crime, they fled with haste unto my father's court, and, first and foremost, courting trust in time, did as they pleased of what was past report, whilst they, save what them helped, all things suppressed, mild pity pleading for affliction's part, his generous mind, still tendering the distressed, was won to them by this deceiving art. Oft men of judges' sense of parties gone, where both their ears were patent but to one. Then, Cyraxi, monarch of the Medes, to prosecute those fugitives to death. In indignation of my father's deeds, did brag them both with all the words of wrath. My father! thinking that his court should be a sanctuary supplicants to save, did levy men to make the world then see, in spite of power that weakness help should have. Thus, mortal wars on every side proclaimed, with mutual trouble did continue long, till both the armies by Bologna tamed did irk to venge or to maintain a wrong. It chanced, while peace was at the highest dearth, that all their forces did with fury fight, a sudden darkness curtained up the earth, and did by violence displace the light. I think the sun for Phaeton looked sad, else blushed reflecting blood like them he saw. For as when wronged of old with grief gone mad, he from the world his chariot did withdraw. Yet ignorance, which doth confusion breed, by wrestling nature's course found cause of fears, which error did so happily succeed that a conquered wrought, and truce from tears, then straight there was a perfect peace begun, and that it might more constantly endure. Astyges, the king of Media's son, to be his queen, my sister did procure. A deadly rancor reconciled again with consanguinity mm -hmm. would sealed remain. Mm -hmm. He, since his father's age-worn course expired, probably expire it, hath ruled his people free from blood or strife, till now a viper hath his death conspired, who from his loins extracted had his life. I mean, this Cyrus, base Cambius' brood, who by a bitch nursed with the country swains, no sign observed importing princely blood, the doggish nature of his nurse retains. He came against his grandfather to field, and unexpected with a mighty power, his forces forced did force himself to yield, who, captive kept, now waits for death each hour, that you may mark how great my interest is. This ruthful story I did largely touch. Those circumstances show that shame of his doth from our glory derogate too much. 
dare any prince presume to trouble thus, one whom our kingdom's favor should defend, in strict affinity combined with us, yet not regarded for so great a friend. This, with some joy, doth smooth my stormy mind, whilst I for Medes against the Persians go. I hope that both by brave effects shall find how kind a friend I prove, how fierce a foe. Though nature's law you care not to transgress, nor at this your wronged ally would not repair, yet the regard to monarchs in distress should move the mighty with a mutual care. Those terrors too which thunder in your ear, I think the Lydians did, will not well allow, for when the cedar falls, the oak may fear that which overthrows the meads may trouble you. And when a neighbor's house they burning view, then their own dangers men may apprehend. It better is with others to pursue than be when alone forced to defend. <sighs> this is but the outside of your course, a dangerous ambush which ambition plants. There may come rivers raging from this source of, uh, to drown your state, which whilst such high thoughts not daunts. I know those newborn monsters of your mind have armed your ravished hearts with fair conceits. Yet those may those wonders which you have defined prove traitorous projects, painted for deceit. And pardon, sir, it is not good to, to be too rashly stout nor curiously wise. Yet lest that you leave that which we certain see, and not attain to that which you devise. I grant, indeed, this uh, very few shall know. Though I profess but to relieve my friend, my thoughts conceive as success may show, and not without great cause a greater end. You see how fortune not but change effects. Some are reproached, others that may be praised, and every age brings forth some strange effects. Some men must fall that others may be raised. I doubt not you have heard who was the first for warring with the world whom fame revives, who had of sovereignty so great a thirst that it could not be quenched with thousands' lives. Even he who first obtained the name of Jove and rest reputed for his glorious acts, the most imperious of the powers above who vows and offerings of the world exacts, he all his time in state did terror breathe, breath, born to acquaint the world with war and death, dearth, whilst fertile still in misery and death, to fatal furies that afflict the earth. I'm going to do that quatrain again. Um, he all his time in state did terror breath, born to acquaint the world with war and dearth, whilst fertile still in misery and death to fatal furies that afflict the earth. Yet since his course, the world's first plague was past, when his proud race had many ages reigned. That empire, too, did perish at the last, and what it lost by Marshal Medes was gained. This was the cause of that great kingdom's fall, a prince who could not judge of princely parts, with loss of scepter, honor, life, and all, to buy base joys sold all his subjects' hearts. To that disastrous monarchy's decay, the aspiring Persians purpose to succeed, but I intend their lofty course to stay. And in that time, ere that it thoroughly speed, the Persians once the Lydians' force must prove, and oh, who knows but that it is ordained at the tribunal of the states above, that I should reign where famous Ninus reigned. This all the host of heaven oft time foretells. To this the gods of Greece my mind have moved, and he that in Arabia's desert dwells by his response this enterprise approved thus still in love with what we mind to do what we affect we fairest still conceive this feeds our humor whilst self flatterers low to show our wit we would ourselves deceive vain hopes so mask all doubts you cannot spy what danger, secret danger this design doth bear but whilst well viewed with an indifferent eye, there want not grounds where foresight may find fear. 
you unadvisedly purpose to pursue a barbarous people opposite to peace who but by robbery to their greatness grew and would for each light cause the war's embrace. No dainty skills dipped in Assyrian dye do deck their bodies to abase their minds. Skins reft from beasts and clothed from who danger ply, not moved by flattering suns nor bragging winds. They simply feed and are not grieved each day with stomachs cloyed and decocting um, diverse meats. They fare not as they would, but as they may, of judgment sound, not carried with conceits, those ancient customs which they secret which they strictly hold make all things easy that they feel no pain this cools the summer's heat kills winter's cold this makes the rivers dry the mountains plain they whose ambition poverty did bound of lydia's dainties if they once do taste will have in hatred straight their barren ground and all our treasures insolently waste to govern such Although that we prevail, you shall but by vexation with your blood and do yourself and yours, if fortune fail, from sovereignty by time secured, seclude. Yea, yea though, though this rash desire your judgment blinds, I for my part must praise the gods for you who have not yet inspired the Persians' minds to waste with war all Lydia long ere now. Those flames which burn my breast must once burst out. Your counsel for more quiet minds I leave. And be you still thought wise, so I prove stout, I'll conquer more, or lose the thing I have. Ah, uh, <laughs> my forced out of affliction store for my mind's ease a few sad words to strain. Yet unloaded now to load it more, I empty but mine eyes to fill again. My soul must sound even as my passions strike, while sighs and tears would fain afford relief. My breast and eyes are both accursed alike, the cabinet of care, the springs of relief. Sorry, the springs of grief. O oh, cruel heaven, fierce star, unhappy fate, too foul injustice of celestial powers, whose high disdain to me with partial hate the comfort of the world, poor world devours. Cursed be the day in which I first was born, when lying tongues affirmed I came to light. A monstrous blasphemy, a mighty scorn, since whose dark sorrow breeds an endless night. Would God I then had chanted this life to leave, the tomb straight taking what the womb did give, then always buried, changing but the grave. I had not lived to die, but died to live. What profited to me my parents' joys, who with such pomp did solemnize my birth, since still my soul must flow to midst a noise, so to defray one dram of tasted mirth. And it did only serve to make me know the height of horror, threatening to succeed. I was but raised up high to be brought low, that short-lived joys might endless anguish breed. Whilst nothing did for my confusion lack, all my best deeds did but betray my state. My virtues too were guilty of my rack, and warred against me, bandied with my fate. For whilst my virgin years with praise I passed, which did, ah, oh, that it did too much import, my modest eye told that my mind was chaste, which gained the warrant of the world's report. And all should have a great respect to fame, no greater dowry than a spotless name. Fair beauty's goddess. Thou canst bear record by offering never made thine altar rich. Lasci lascivious fancies highly I abhorred, whose freeborn thoughts no folly could bewitch. Tell happily, ah, it seems so to some, but oh, but unhappily the end have proved all this and more to Attis ears did come, who straight did like and after liking love. He to our ears his purpose to impart, not lip-sick lover-like, with words for our sort, 
whose tongue was but an agent for his heart, yet could not tell the tenth part that it thought. And lest his travel should have seemed to tend my no, sorry, my honour's fame, my fancies to betray, he brought his wishes to a lawful end, and in effect, affection did parade. There, Juno, president of wedlock's vow, and Hymen with his odiferous coat, with sacred customs did our love allow, whilst the ominous owls no crosses did devote. The blessing that this marriage did procure, it was too great to have continued long, a thing to vehement cannot endure, our joy is far past the reach of any tongue. We ever did full satisfaction find, yet with satiety were never cloyed, but seemed to bodies managed by one mind. Such was the happiness that I enjoyed. He loved me dearly. I paid his will. Proud of myself because that I was his, a harmony remained betwixt the still, who each in the other placed their soul's chief bliss. This moved the immortals to a high disdain that does to worldlings who of death were heirs should in a paradise of joys remain which did exceed at least did equal theirs but chiefly juno to despite it most who through a jealousy still jars with love that body poisoned souls of that could boast which she although heaven's queen had not above Thus, even for envy of our rare delights, the fatal sisters, by the heavens suborned, of my soul's treasure closed the lovely lights by which they thought the earth too much adorned. Oh, but he is not dead, he lives in me. Ah, but I live not, I died in him. How can the other one without the other be? If death have set his eyes, mine must look dim, since to my sight that sun no more appeared from whom my beauties borrowed all their rays. A long eclipse that never shall be cleared have darkened all the points of my sad day. Ay me, I live too long, he died too soon, that still the worst remained, the best did part of him who told how this cursed deed was done, and the words, like swords, shall never, shall ever wound my heart, fierce tyrant death, who in thy wrath didst take one half of me and left one half behind, take this to thee, or give me the other back, be wholly cruel, or be no way kind, but whilst I live, Believe, thou canst not die. Oh, oh, even in spite of death, yet still my choice oft with the inward all beholding. I, I think I see thee and I hear thy voice. And to, the, and to content my languishing desire, to ease my mind, each thing some help affords. Thy fancied form doth oft such faith acquire that all that in all sounds I apprehend thy words. And with such thoughts my memory to wound, I call to mind thy looks, thy words, thy grace. Where thou didst haunt, yet I adore the ground. And when, where thou stepped, O oh, sacred, seems that place. My solitary walks, my widowed bed, my dreary sighs, my sheets oft bathed with tears, these shall record what life by me is led, since first sad news breathed deep death into mine ears, though for more pain yet spared, a, sp a space by death, the thee first I loved, with thee all love I leave, for my Chaste flames which quenched were with thy breath can kindle now no more but in thy grave. By night I wish for day, by day for night. Yet wish far more that none of both might be. But most of all that banished from the light I were no more their constant change to see. 
at night, whilst deeply musing of my state, I go to some with sighs, my wounds to joys and agony, then in sad conceit doth blot the blubbered count with new annoyance. When sleep, the brother most resembling death of darkness, child and father unto rest doth bound, will not restrain confused breath, that it may vent, but not with words expressed. Then with my sprite thou dost begin to speak with sugared speeches to appease my grief. And my bruised heart, which laboured long to break, doth in this com comfort feigned find some relief. Yeah, if our souls remained united, so this late divorce would no way vex my mind. But when awaking, it augments my woe, whilst this a dream and me a wretch I find, if never happy, oh, thrice happy am I. <laughs> but happy more had happiness remained. Yet then excessive joy had made me die. Since such delights what heart could have sustained? I waste I thus, whilst vainly I lament the precious treasure of that swift past time. Oh, art me, dear love, for I repent my lingering here, my fate and not my crime. Since, since first thy body did enrich the tomb in this spoiled world, my eye no pleasure sees, and that is. That's it. Lo, I come, I come to be thy mate amongst the myrtle trees. And that was the uh, this week's guest on Griefcast, um, uh, Celia. Um, yes, I mean, out of nowhere, Celia turns up and just goes, right, the stage is mine. <laughs> well done, Greg. <laughs> Um, that's a really difficult scene to make work because it's just, you can hear it turning course. You can hear the gears going because it's starting with Croesus, son is dead, uh, someone comes on and then it has to just turn and go, okay, let's, we've got some, we're going to set up for the third, the, the last act. Uh, some backstories. Um, so Croesus has to just go in a totally different direction now. Uh, and it's fun. But my my word, there's a gear change that happens there. Um, <laughs> he's just... Yeah, I think he's just going to flip. Um, so, yeah. I, 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 we, we're, we're set up for tomorrow, uh, for the next session. Uh, uh, we're, you know, back, we've got Cyrus... Um, the Walls of Cyrus is also available, and uh, Cambyses. The Cambyses is also available. Um, you know things that we have covered in other set, uh, other plays and other interpretations. So um, it's sort of like we're coming back to familiar territory. Um, so yes, uh, and then then we get Celia just comes back and does her thing. Wow. Thoughts in the room. <laughs> I'll go to Emily then Rachel. <laughs> um, I, I put some of this in the chat, so I hope I remember it. Uh, yeah, you're so right. Completely different direction, and yet not. Because what I'm finding is that Croesus, in that beautiful, dramatic way, and this is where I think he's like, if people are looking for new characters to play, this is what they should check out Croesus, because he's got some good stuff in there. Um, and, and his fundamental thing is always, oh, that didn't work try this thing. Oh, that didn't work. Try this thing. Obstacle. Let me try a new way around it. Obstacle. Let me try a new way around it. And so by this point, he just, um, it, it felt very much like a, a Marlovian type Faust of someone saying, mm, that may not be your best idea. I'm like, I'm going to do it more. No, 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 no. Hold on. Let me tell you why this is awesome. There was a touch of Ozymandias in there of like, everyone else were suckers and, you know, have fallen. But me, more. Um, like, and, and I mean, this is what we come to verse plays for, right? Is that you could just be like screaming on a stage in the, you know, the barren plains while one person tells you bad idea and you just commit <laughs> commit to the worst idea well but it makes sense by act four 
you've tried all your good ideas like oh okay well a spear is going to kill him no problem get rid of anything pointy no problem oh that's not going to work well then let me get someone else oh that's not going to work well this i'm going to pardon you oh you killed yourself anyway okay you know what it, we're out of options and we're just going to take over the world that's where we're at you will remember my name damn it and it feels kind of like this lovely both villain and hero origin story that you didn't know what was happening why do we still say Croesus's name it's because of all this um and then it was so exciting as as we were saying in the chat to, to like all of a sudden we had dialogue and not just speeches and it wasn't just dialogue it was rhyming couplets which just go so fast and we were playing the game of like I'm taking over the next line so you don't get to finish the couplet because I have a rejoinder thank you very much and then Alex, good old Alexander, I'm getting very excited because it was a very exciting scene. Alexander like found his hip hop flow. He's doing interior rhymes. He's doing, you know, like, I mean, gravy and grave type stuff, you know, in terms of wordplay. Um, he's doing like it was so easy with the exception of that one quatrain where I'm like, what are you doing here? This is tough. Um, but like it's it. it it, 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 it was a hip hop flow, man. He found really cool stuff. Um, it's too long. The scene is too long. It needs to be cut down for performance. Um, definitely what happened is Alexander went, I understand how this works. I am master of verse drama. Let me keep writing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like, like good on for him. I, I like this scene. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, and the great thing is, if someone writes too much, you know, it's it's an easily solvable problem. Um, you know, this is not an issue. It's when it's when you got a scene that's undeveloped and you're going, damn, we have to come up with something to f fill in the gaps. Um, uh, so yeah, not not an issue. Uh, Rachel, I think were you waving earlier? Uh, did I imagine that? Um, if not, I'll go to Eric. Um, um no, I was just gonna say, uh, I'd really like to do a second look specifically because of you know, like this scene that we just did this was so um easy to get lost in and then um i put this in the chat before but this play so far is like it's half in between a written poem and half a play and it seems so far like one of these transitional works like in a writer's career from one um from one form to another uh yeah, but I'd, I'd just like to revisit this so far because of uh, the, I think there's still so much more to uh, figure out and I'm getting a little lost in some parts. Mm. Uh, Eric, then Greg. Yeah, I'm just going to bring the, the the intelligence level down because everyone was amazing, um, including Greg. Uh, bravo for that speech. <laughs> yeah, it's, it feels like this scene just feels very much like so pinky. You know what we're gonna do today tonight? Uh, we're gonna open the fridge and steal some cheese? No! We will take over the world! Uh, and it's just very much, it feels a bit like that, but sort of like, you know, with a guy who actually has an army that is not equipped, because thus far we've heard that like he didn't have any pointy things to aim at people, yeah. um, which seems a bit weird. And then suddenly he's like, let me take over the world with this army that doesn't have any pointing things. But then we don't care about that because flow and narrative. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they can build up a, a, a supply of pointy things. You know, they, you know, I'm, I'm sure if they, they, they all work very, very hard and they're very good. Uh, Santa will give them some pointy things. Uh, Greg. I, no, I mean, I, going back to the conversation we had earlier, I, again, K, whatever our name is, <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go with Celia because I think Kalia just sounds like it's going to be a dance party. Um... <laughs> Sorry, oh, oh, it's the second time you managed to stop me mid sentence. Um, yeah, yeah, she, I, I, I almost feels like it's a scene to herself. Um, I don't feel like she's come in at any point in that previous scene. I very much feel like that is a complete <clears throat> end of a scene, beginning of a new one because. And what's really interesting, having played um, Solon last night and had that huge, long Solon speech at the start, 
was it this uh, you know one at some point in acts one or two um it was really nice to have a speech where i didn't feel any word was wasted there was no point where i felt like she was just waffling she everything everything was really oh my god grief written across it and and yeah no fab fab speech and almost could be taken out of context and used as a as an as a monologue of its own accord. Well, I say well, because I put in the chat. I was saying, you know, it feels like it's almost like five minutes too late. It's like you know, she 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 missed a cue uh, yeah, it does, and just does feel off. like it should have been in the previous scene yeah. to me. But I do wonder whether there's a, there's something that could be done, you know, with some textual interference where you know that 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 moment could be part of a uh, of a, a a sort of big griefy scene. Um, but um, oh, I see your objection, uh, Emily. Yes, I do object and strenuously um, <laughs> because, yes, I, I, because it looks like by the end, right, she's pulled a, a, a thisbe. She's she's about to do what everyone else is doing and be extremely Roman, um, right? And so I think if you do that in the previous scene, there's no place else for Croesus to go in the following acts. Mm -hmm. I think this is perfect to put at the end of this act where just sort of everyone dies because you need something else for Croesus to react to. Um, so I think if you put it earlier, um, you actually are probably going to miss something structurally later. Uh, okay. We're into final thoughts territory. And um, so some of you have been here uh, for the first third um and so we'll we'll have a, a more of an overview and uh and uh, some of you've been, been here today uh so uh rachel uh how are you feeling about the overall shape of the uh, of of the show as it were um uh, we've already discussed you know cuts it's it, it is a it is a long text um you know it cuts off you know par for the course i mean you could do it all but uh uh, uh, uh unabridged but um you know it, it's definitely there as an option uh but yeah just just uh, uh thoughts about its overall shape and uh and uh any any other additional things you haven't had a chance to mention um yeah i mean some of the some of the speeches definitely could be because it's Oh, oh my, uh, e even as an actor, it's like, okay, this is testing the limits of, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere. It's like they're about to leave. Uh, they're so long. They're miles long. Anyway, that's the, what I really want to say is this little play is a, a lovable little weirdo. Um, second look, please. Uh, uh, Eric, you weren't here before, so you you only have the evidence of, of what you've been in the room for. Uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, it seems like um, I was going to say something intelligent, and then I forgot. Um, <laughs> you know, as as always happens. Um, yeah, it just it's an interesting play because it's kind of you could wedge it bit, like going from Johnson to this feels very much like because we had like every man in his humor earlier today, uh, or well, part of it, part two. I think anyway, um, yeah, and be released we, next week, yeah, and <laughs> coming soon. Time, time is weird, anyway, yeah. It just kind of feels like sort of like that is a comedy about people aspiring to greatness and sort of that kind of thing. Whereas this one is the tragedy version where things go terribly, terribly wrong all the way through. Um, I mean. I guess in the other one, things do go terribly wrong, but we laugh at them, um, which is, I, I don't know, just an interesting sort of juxtaposition of, <laughs> of oh, long words, um, juxtaposition of, how do you call it, uh, styles and sort of things. Obviously, neoclassical tragedy didn't seem, I don't know, does it go out of style? It probably does because people, they're bored of people going, oh, woe is me, um, for however many hours. But um, I, I'm enjoying the language in this. It's so different to everything else we've done thus far. I mean, we, we had the sort of um, the Samuel Daniel ones that were sort of very vivid and descriptive and very true to form in terms of sort of um, describing things off stage. Um, you know, like the messenger coming in to report how Cleopatra died for four pages. 
Uh, <laughs> and, well, yeah, and, and with Samuel Daniel, he's and especially in that Cleopatra, he's constantly passing the baton of people reporting other people's speech as well. It's almost like a shared, yeah, uh, yeah. shared narrative. It was, it was. It, it, uh, there was something really, really interesting about the way that one was working um, yeah whereas this one I, I, I don't know if you had a messenger yesterday but it just seems like well the messenger came and sort of missed <laughs> like you weren't home when that happened so he left we, we we came to report some terrible news but you were out uh greg <laughs> yeah <laughs> any final thoughts <laughs> oh that's it i'm not here tomorrow <laughs> no um after the uh, utterly, to me, unlikable Solon, it, it was fab to get three, two, three, whatever it is, characters, um, so to speak, that were really interesting. Um, the, and I really found the playing with style, playing with form really interesting, especially with that middle, the chorus in this act. Um, such an interesting way of doing it. And yeah. I mean, who can complain when you get a speech like Kyrgyz Kyrgyz? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get another tr pronunciation in before the end. Um, but yeah, no, fab. Thank you, everyone. Really good. And Emily, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I agree with Rachel. This is sort of a, a darling, weird little play. Um, and it's really fascinating to... It's got some some gems in there. It's got some beautiful lines um, and it's it's playing with verse in a way that I haven't seen as much. So I'm I'm now really curious about this playwright and want to like read all his stuff and see what he was experimenting with. Um, and and uh, I hope that his plays don't just stay in the closet. They need to be worked with to be on the stage, but I hope they don't stay in the closet. <laughs> Ah, excellent, uh, uh, excellent uh, close, closing statement. Yes, we will be returning. That is the plan. And uh, the, the, there are three more plays uh, once we complete this one. Uh, we have uh, King Darius to come. Everyone's eyes light up whenever we mention King Darius because we've done a different King Darius play. And boy, was that weird. Um, so, um, yes, uh, you've already mentioned Julius Caesar and there's uh, uh, Alexander as well. So just to confuse us, uh, Alexander writing about Alexander. Ugh. Um, so uh, all that remains is thank all these wonderful readers. We will return, uh, 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 probably without me hosting, uh, tomorrow uh, for the conclusion of uh, uh, of Croesus. But I might pop in uh, just to make sure that you're all behaving. Uh, oh, thank you very much, everyone, and goodbye. I pardon thee and pity thy despair. <laughs>